Now, for a closer look at Beijing's new investment rules, we welcome Alicia Garcia Herrero, Chief Asia Pacific Economist with asset management company Natixis. So, Alicia, why is China choosing to focus on limiting overseas investments in hotels, property, and sports clubs, etc., as opposed to other sectors? I think that's really the right thing to do. First of all, these are mostly iconic buildings that are very hard to price, which actually instill what I would call irregular or unofficial capital outflows, because you just can't determine the price. So this is really one of the reasons why I think they're, they're targeting these investments, let alone the fact that you don't actually need so much real estate investment in the digital world. So it's in a way overpricing itself. I think it's a good idea. The problem is you might not want to impose it to every single company because at the end of the day, this is, these are also private decisions in many cases, let alone, of course, SOEs. So what are some examples of failed overseas investment by Chinese firms that really sparked concern? I think, you know, the usual suspects would be one-day investments. You can think about Starwoods. This was a 15, uh, sorry, 40 billion uh, M&A deal that was stopped already in 2016. So the idea that this is new, I think that's, that's maybe, it was happening below the radar. Um, and, and I think this is just now the official announcement that, that some deals were not taking place, not because they were stopped by, say, the U.S. Uh, CFUs or any other European uh, entity, which, uh, by the way, does not really exist at the European level. It's more about the Chinese themselves. Um, there are some exceptions to that. Axtron was stopped by CFUs, although it's a European company, uh, uh, claiming that w that was strategically important for the semiconductor industry and that even the price had been manipulated in the stock market. So, you know, there was a number of reasons there. But that is an investment that was strategically important for China in the semiconductor industry. So I think that's when you see moves from the other, uh, from the seller um, uh, countries as opposed to irrational uh, potential purchases which are refrained from the buyer's perspective, i.e. China's government. Right. Now, we know that companies supporting the real economy or working with new technologies can still make overseas investments. What are some of the industries that benefit from that? I think that the benefit is massive. If you think about China's ability to leapfrog uh, in technology beyond what China has already done with inward FDI, but we all know that inward FDI is kind of leveling off. It's, it's just much harder for China to attract enough technology through inward FDI because there is many concerns about uh, market access and, and uh, foreign companies may not be so willing to bring uh, foreign technology. So the way forward, obviously, is to buy it abroad and to bring it back to China in, in a semi-forced way because you actually own the company. So I think it's a very, very clever strategy. And I can understand why the West, in a way, is reacting to this because that's their comparative advantage and, and by allowing Chinese companies to buy. But again, if these are private companies, I think there's very little they can do. Now, one of the concerns, though, was about debt. So why did we see such a rise in these highly debt-fueled overseas investments? Well, it, the reality is that when we think about uh, Chinese outward FDI, people tend to think that China comes with cash and buys. And that's not necessarily the case. Um, in many, many cases, these are leveraged buyouts, i.e., they literally increase China's debt, be it the corporate, um, the corporate in itself, uh, sometimes domestic debt, i.e., they use uh, domestic uh, capital markets, for example, in many, many cases, China Development Bank, et cetera. But sometimes it's actually offshore funding, i.e., dollar funding, to, per to purchase assets abroad. And that is in, in itself, of course, um, a, a warning signal because China is already so leveraged. So, uh, so this is, I think, one of the reasons. It, and by the way, if they were to pay with, with hard currency, a, a, a US dollar a loan from Exim Bank, say, to whatever SOE, that would actually imply a withdrawal of foreign reserves. So as, as you can imagine, it's both leverage and also the fact that China wants to keep uh, the level of foreign reserves at the current level, if not higher. So that all also limits the, the ability to purchase assets abroad. All right. Well, thank you so much for your insights. Alicia Garcia Herrero, Chief Economist for the Asia-Pacific region for Natixis.